but also now, <laughs> some principles. So these are the five factors. Now we get some principles of strategy. And then when we look from Sun Tzu to more modern things, we'll add to his list. But here's what. <laughs> All warfare is based on deception. So, This is, I'm stating this is a noun rather than a principle, but all warfare is based on deception. So we could say, yeah, use it. <laughs> now that doesn't sound like a good thing to say in an ethics class. <laughs> but on the other hand, there are occasions where deception is not only moral, but actually what you ought to do. It's life or death. Yeah, good, it's life or death. Awesome. And so... That's a situation where you might think, look, it's really important to deceive the other person. You're, you're in a fight to the death. Um, can you think of other cases where deception is a good thing? White lies. <laughs> good. White lies? Yes. <laughs> it's our theme. Did you said lies were never... <laughs> oh, I did not. No, I said, she said I big, big lies. Big, like, like real lies. White lies are totally fine in my book. Oh, yes. Money. I mean, white lies... I, yeah. I mean, probably, if you went through and counted the number of white lies we tell. Yeah, we talked about white lies yesterday with, with uh, David. Yeah. White lies are real lies. Ah, I'm okay lies. with both. Good. But now, yeah, let's think about real lies, though. When is it appropriate to tell a real lie? We, we actually struggle to come up with a scenario. Uh, we don't think well, no, we no, we don't. scenarios, but only that we're self-serving. We don't we think that lies an entirely yeah. selfless one. Ah. There could be a mutually we beneficial one. The other person. Oh, right. What about there were ones that benefited the other person. Oh, so, uh, what they're like, they're like telling me everything's going to be okay, and they're like, clearly dying. Like, they got I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that they're okay. like, yeah, everything's going to be fine. Right. And like, both people know that it's not going to be fine. Does that count? Yeah. Ooh, that might count, yes. And we can make it an even better case if it's not certain the person's dying. If we say, actually, look, this person, the odds are against them, let's say, but their odds improve dramatically if they believe and are trying to stay alive, right, rather than giving up. In that case, you might think, yeah, we should tell the patient a lie. Say, no, no, you're going to recover when it's actually well, I like... I don't know if it should be a hate, like, I don't know if it should be, like, a medical professional telling somebody this, but maybe, like... You know. Well, it could be that, or it could be, you know, on the battlefield, somebody's Bad hurt. Field. How badly am I hurt? And, Not bad. Not bad. You don't need your legs. Yeah, exactly. Um, that's <laughs> a sort of routine kind of lie, and sometimes it's just, let's let, let this guy's last minute be <laughs> more pleasant, but sometimes it's, look, if you, if you don't give up, your chances are better. Uh, can you think of other kinds of lies in a more competitive context? Um, we sold out of that product, and maybe that... Causes fear that oh they they that is actually a a good product maybe we should make more of them or do something and and falsely paint a picture that sales are going the sales that that product was really successful when really it wasn't so hmm. um, and why is this a good thing to do <laughs> <laughs> I know it's not good okay it's not good it's okay bad. yeah well all right. It, there might be occasions where it's to your advantage, clearly, even though it's pretty immoral. But let, let's suppose you're a football coach. Go back to that. Suppose you do make it really obvious to the other side that in first down, you always throw a screen pass, and on second down, you always run it up the middle. Um, that's bad, right? In football, you're supposed to be using deception. You're supposed to be keeping the other side uncertain about what to do. Um, or think about the D-Day invasion where the obvious place to attack was Calais, since it was the place where the English Channel was the narrowest, and there was a sort of feint at an attack on Calais, precisely so that the Germans kept their forces over there and didn't anticipate the large attack in Normandy. That was a case of deception. It wasn't exactly a direct lie in the sense that Eisenhower said, I'm attacking at Calais, but it was almost that. The attack started at Calais, and that was just a small force meant to keep the Germans in position while the main attack went elsewhere. And so in warfare, trying to deceive the enemy, trying to make them think you're over there when you're really here, and so on, if you will attack when you won't, etc., that's crucial. Well, to kind of build up on what Janice was saying, what about, like, the illusion of scarcity? So, like, whereas, like, salmon, for example, is a good example because there's an illusion that there's not enough salmon, which is why it's more expensive. Right. Or like with iPhones or Apple, like Microsoft, there's an illusion that there aren't many, so that's why the price is higher, mm -hmm. so it's supply and demand. 
That's a good point. So okay, yes, oh, now I see what's happening. Yeah, I might say, look, you know, there's great demand from this. Actually, actually, yeah, I've been part of a concert series where sometimes the person running it has been saying, you know, we're almost sold out. <laughs> and sometimes that's actually been true. This last one really did sell out, and I think everyone was shocked because we said that so many times in the past. Then you show up and there are 80 people in a place that will hold 300. But this time, wow, it really did sell out. Uh, but yeah, sometimes we'll do people will do that. Or you're right, Apple products. You know, ooh, you know, they they want the long line to yeah, make it seem like it's right. uh, it's it's scarce and like you're really special for having one and all of that. Uh, so yeah, there can be a variety of circumstances where deception is really a good thing, partly marketing, partly a question of keeping the other side guessing. You want to win. You've got to, let's say you believe in your vision, you think this is an important thing. Well then, there are going to be other people who oppose you in this. You want to deceive them and be hard for them to predict. You don't want them to easily anticipate and counter your moves. What about your business competition also? You want to... Exactly. Right. As well. That's right. You want to deceive your competition. And so he will end up saying all sorts of things about this. Uh, uh, yeah, when able to attack, we must seem unable. When using our forces, we must seem inactive. When we're near, we must make the enemy believe we're far away. When far away, make him believe we're near. Hold up baits to entice the enemy. Feign disorder and crush him. If he's secure at all points, be prepared for him. If he's superior strength, evade him. In short, try to seem. <laughs> <clears throat> to be what you want. Historical example, Eisenhower, actually. He cultivated this image while he was president of being kind of a lackadaisical president, of barely doing the job, of golfing a lot, of taking a lot of afternoons off, and so on. In fact, he woke up every morning at 5 a.m., so by the time the rest of the White House staff arrived at 9, he had already been working for four hours. And so if he went out and played golf at 2 or 3, actually, think about that, he had already put in a really long day. Um, but he kept that a secret. Uh, almost nobody knew. In fact, Richard Nixon described Eisenhower as complex and devious. <laughs> and when Nixon describes you as complex <laughs> and devious, man! Um, but this was part of what Eisenhower learned in being commander in World War II. Seem to be what you are and used that to his political advantage. Seem to be concerned about this when you're really going for this other objective over here. Seem to be goofing off and not exerting much energy when you're really working very hard, and so on and so forth. FDR, he would never have a picture taken below the table because he was in a wheelchair. That's, that's right. There's this one photograph of FDR sitting in a wheelchair with a, a kitten on his lap, I think, and a, beside a little girl. And the reason that's such a remarkable photograph is that it's the only mm -hmm. one like that that exists. Mm -hmm. He wanted to be photographed as much as possible standing up and as much as possible without mm -hmm. um, any, any uh, suggestion of his infirmity. Mm -hmm. um, so there are a lot of photographs of him standing, and if you look carefully, you can realize, oh wait, he's leaning on that railing. Or, mm -hmm. you know, the, the admiral he's standing next to is actually sort of probably oh. <laughs> Um, but yeah, he thought it was very important to seem to be strong, even though in many cases he was not strong at all, physically. Um, other principles that are important for us to know in the context of strategy. Here's one that I really like. It says, if your opponent is of choleric temper, seek to irritate him. <laughs> Pretend to be weak that he may grow arrogant. If he's taking his ease, give him no rest. If his forces are united, separate them. Attack him where he's unprepared. Appear where you're not expected. Now this is different from, you might say, uh, knowing yourself. It's really a question of know your enemy. And so at the end he says, a general who knows himself, but not his enemy, will win about half the time. Someone who knows the enemy, but not himself, will win maybe half the time. Someone who knows neither is destined to lose. Somebody who knows both will win. And so we could say two really important ones here, implicit in what's being said. Know yourself. And also, know your enemy. And now, this the idea, if your opponent is of a choleric temper, <laughs> seek to irritate it. I mean, it's like one of my favorite maxims myself. Keep those unbalanced people off balance. <laughs> okay. It's like, like, yeah, I mean, if, if this person's a little unstable, 
make them even less stable. Um, you know that person's prone to anger, piss him off. Uh, <laughs> if you know that person doesn't really respond, you know, then uh, hey, take advantage of that and so on. So, in short, I think it seems to me basically take advantage. As opposed to trying to change the person? Yeah, oh, exactly. Take advantage of your opponent's weaknesses and tendencies. If you know your opponent, you'll know what their weaknesses are, you'll know what their tendencies are, and then you can use that to your own advantage. All right, some others. <laughs> yeah, one of my favorites is this. When you engage in actual fight, victory is long in coming, then men's weapons will grow dull and their ardor will be damped. If you lay siege to a town, you'll exhaust your strength. If the campaign is protracted, the resources of the state will not be equal to the strain. And in all these cases, you'll be taken advantage of. So, in short, he said there's no instance of a country having benefited from prolonged warfare. So, a wise general attacks and tries to win quickly. Let the great object be victory. So, yeah. Seek to win and try to win fast. Uh, now, in, actually, part of the reason that Colin Powell, for example, had this book distributed is this was one of the main things he learned in Vietnam. Uh, Vietnam was a very incremental war. Let's do this. Uh, let's send a few more troops. Right at the beginning, the general said it'll take 700,000 to a million men to actually defeat the enemy. But Johnson wouldn't do that. There was this incremental strategy of, well, we'll send 50,000 troops, then 50,000 more, and so on and so forth. And in a sense here, Sons was saying, look, don't do that. <laughs> Commit. Here's another way of going. You know, go all in. Go hard, go home. That's, yeah, exactly right. So, precisely, I mean. It's actually fairly counter with a lot of modern business strategy. That's right, exactly. Um, it's really saying, you know, don't hedge your bets. <laughs> uh, Try to win quickly, and don't be in it for the long term. Now, I'm not sure that's always great strategy. So what are, I mean, he's thinking about a military context in which it undoubtedly is. You will exhaust your people. Um, in a democracy, if anything, it's worse because you will lose political support as well as you know, start putting a financial strain on the people and everything else. But in business, sometimes it's analogous to that. But sometimes in business it's not. So under what circumstances would it be okay to have, in fact, a good thing to really be playing the long game? Take, oh. Yeah, go. Well, not to play the long game. Okay, I okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I mean, sometimes it is, it seems to me. So the long game can be appropriate. In fact, it wasn't a Chow and Lai who went asked about his reaction to the French Revolution, or what he thought of the French Revolution, said it's too early to tell. Um, it's like, yeah, it's only been 250 some, years. Some companies, <laughs> some companies think take the long game. For example, Google. Google doesn't sell its products right away. Like he, they give away most of their products, like their Gmail, um, the search engine, and everything. So they're they want to acquire like most. Tech companies want to acquire a great number of users like Facebook, right. and then they'll uh, monetize it afterwards. So, like oh, Facebook good. is a great example where like they want to have a bunch like billions of users, and then they'll monetize or Twitter even by selling ads. So they're mm -hmm. playing the long haul. Right. Yeah, well, Google is literally one of Google's like googly principles or whatever is actually fail fast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. that's Well, that's a good point. One way of taking this is to say, look, <laughs> give up on things quickly. Have a long-term objective. Stick with that. And if you're doing things that don't help you achieve it, drop those quickly. But on the other hand, the ultimate goal is one that requires... I mean, suppose you... I'm embarrassed to admit this, but if somebody had come to me and said, we're going to do what? You're, we're going to create this search engine and give it away for free. Or we're going to do this social networking thing and give it away for free. What's that? Well, that's very nice of you. What a philanthropist. <laughs> There's no way of making money out of that, right? And i got to admit, I still don't get it. Yeah. I mean, whoever clicks on those ads on the side? I don't know. 
I don't. I don't even look at them. <laughs> no one clicks on them on purpose, but people click on them all the time because no, they then, get in your way. No. They also generate Ooh. based on like your interests. So like yeah. the ads you see and the ads I see are completely different. I've noticed that. And yeah. on Facebook, and on Facebook, there's a lot of tricky because a lot of the posts are just in your newsfeed, and they're, That's they're exactly old sponsored, and, sponsored. And, like, yeah. and then you like realize you didn't like it or whatever. Yeah. No, I, I've noticed part of, partly because I used to get all these things for playing the bass. You know, it's like ooh, bass lessons or bass guitars and all this stuff. Then, as a gift, I buy my wife a dress, and now suddenly it's all these <laughs> dresses. <laughs> <laughs> I prefer the bass playing. <laughs> <laughs> so, I actually think it's super creepy. Yeah. It is creepy. It's like, how do they know? Well, Gmail does that like yeah, on your speech. emails. They read yeah. your emails and they give you ads yeah. based on your email. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I should start sending myself emails about these emails. Pulling the words yeah. out of they're pulling the words out of your Not that they're reading well. what you compose. Well, no person's reading them, but the algorithm yeah. is reading them. That's, that's, right. that's really yeah. interesting. No, it's, like it's creepy. Yeah, so. No, yeah. it's weird. But the thing that Google does, I mean, the thing that Google does with well, their advertising is a little bit different, though, too, because, right, you think that they're just going to put ads on the side, but really what it is is the thing you're searching for also has an ad, like they have their AdWords, it's oh, such right. a high business for them. Yeah, right. And most of the Google time... is an advertising company. That's yeah, and most yeah. of the time, like, the advertising on Google is an ad for the thing that you're looking for. Right, like, so their algorithm is a little bit like Facebook, where it's, like, relating what you're doing. Oh, yeah, because right. on Google, you're actually... Searching for something, whereas on Facebook. Yeah, sometimes the AdWords are a competition for what you're searching for, but usually I think your searching for is also still there. Ah, uh, right, right. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, interesting. Yeah. All right, well. Anyway, not a <laughs> yes, hero there. Sometimes, anyway, the long game is the thing to Sorry. play. It depends on your organization and what your objectives are. Um, in the military, your objective is to win and go home. Um, and in higher education, that's not the case. That's right. It's like, what would it mean for UT to win? It's right. like, yay, all Texans are educated, we quit. <laughs> it's not like that, right? So, of course, we're playing a very long game. It depends on what your objectives are. And so, I guess one way to look at this is, it depends on your vision. You have to understand what the vision is, and what the time frame is that that imposes on you. And sometimes, that's something that can be, and in fact, is best accomplished quickly. Sometimes that's something that really is a very long term. Okay, so an example, a real life example would be if you're launching a product or a service, but you need to, um, um, crap, I should know the term for this. Um, you have to, like, massage the market, kind of. You have to, there's a term for it, but you have to do the market to want the thing that you're launching, but they didn't know they wanted before. That's a long game. Create, Ooh, uh, that's right. Demand. Yeah, yeah, that's it, yeah. That's right. There are all sorts of products where people didn't even have a concept of that. I mean, some things are easy, right? People think, ooh, I really wish there were something that did this, and then you introduce that. But sometimes you've got something that's so dramatically new that nobody, like, actually, a tablet, right? It's this, this sort of thing that's halfway between a phone and a, a, a laptop. Nobody had an idea. And initially, nobody thought, ooh, I'd like to have a thing like that. You People had to sort of, you know, create a certain demand. Um, iPads were, at an early stage, given to a lot of UT faculty. Uh, partly the university did that, but partly Apple partnered, gave us a great deal, and so on. Basically because they wanted us to be, to realize this is a cool thing. And indeed, I've got to admit, now I, I almost never use my laptop. I just use that, or my desktop computer, depending on what I'm doing. And so, it was a case of playing this long game, and initially, you know, giving these products away, or selling them at cost to school districts and mm -hmm. universities and so on to actually you get people to see what to this it. was. You become addicted to it. And then you become You're addicted. Like, I have to have it. That's right. Now my daughter has two, for example. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so, so yeah, exactly. I mean, it's the sort of thing where you, you have to do that and you that requires... Culture. That's right. You have to develop a certain culture in a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. I mean, universities are like that. Mm -hmm. They have to develop a culture where education is valued, where people then at other levels start saying, we have to prepare people for university and and that type of thing. So it does require a big change that happens over a long period of time. A political party might, might be like this. The political party might say, well, I'm not going to accomplish my vision in five years or ten years. Um, I've really got this generational thing, or maybe multi-generational plan, and you know, uh, I'm working on that long game. So it all depends on what you're trying to do. If you're trying to eliminate poverty, let's say, it wouldn't make much sense to say, well, yeah, let's you know, go hard or go home. <laughs> no more poor people in five years. Uh, that's not going to happen. <laughs> but if you think, look, we want over the next 50 years to change uh, things structures. and lower, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly, change structures so the poverty mm -hmm. rates decline dramatically and so on. Well, then, and like that kind of thing is, is a long game because you're not, like, any poverty is not as simple as, like, oh, everyone gets a house. 
here or like a homeless everyone gets a house. You have to like teach people about that like lifestyle. It's a long, it's a long process. You can't like teach a man to fish. He eats for a day, that kind of thing. Well, okay, good. Yeah. So anything that involves changing people's behavior tends to be a long game. Now, sometimes if people were you know respond quickly to incentives, but most things that involve a real change in habits, let's say, <laughs> mm -hmm. aren't like that. We want people to stop smoking. It's not like we can say, hey, quit quit smoking and we'll pay you $100. <laughs> um, that won't work. In fact, a bunch of people will start smoking so they can quit and get the $100. <laughs> a lot of them won't be able to quit, and so you'll probably increase smoking doing that. Uh, really, the better thing to do is to try to gradually change habits over time, because they are habits. Um, it's not like in a company, let's say a lot of people are taking other people's lunches from their refrigerator. Um, that's probably a fairly easy problem to solve. It's not really that people... I don't know. It was a real big issue in my sorority house. Yeah, yeah I was... Uh, as I gave the example, I realized, wait, in a few oh, cases okay. where I've known this happens, it's actually a really hard problem to solve, so maybe... But yes, the more it has to do with character and not just immediate decision-making, the harder it is, and the longer-term the vision has to be.